Hello, welcome to my channel or welcome back if you've been here before. Today I want to talk about my experience um, rereading Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen, which I finished in the month of January. Um, I read this as part of my ongoing challenge to myself for 2021 to read Jane Austen's um, six major novels, and um, I am reading them in companion with this um, critique of Jane Austen's work. It's called Jane Austen, The Secret Radical by Helena Kelly. Um, and each chapter in this book is dedicated to each of the Jane Austen's no each of Jane Austen's novels and um, explains the political, social, and cultural context in which they were written and makes the argument that Jane Austen um, was a very calculated, a uh, very radical writer um, who was kind of masking very radical political and social opinions um, within the kind of wrappings and trappings of seemingly light romantic stories. Um, so fascinating read. Um, and then I also did read Sense and Sensibility. The particular reason I read it in January was as part of a buddy read hosted by um, Megan over at Megan's Reading Revelations. I'll link to her channel below. Um, and she hosted some discussion about this book on her Discord, so it was fun to talk about with other people. Um, so for this video, I, um, I titled, I'm titling it Rereading Sense and Sensibility, but like the video I posted about Pride and Prejudice, which I will link to in the cards, um, I'm not actually going to spend that much time talking about this book itself. Um, I'm going to assume that if you are willing to watch this video, you've already read Sense and Sensibility or are at least vaguely familiar with the plot. Maybe you've seen the um, Emma Thompson adaptation. Um, and what I want to focus on more is um, the things that I learned about uh, Sense and Sensibility from this book in particular. Um, so I will just say you know, right off the bat, this um, sense and sensibility to me, unlike Pride and Prejudice, it's not something that I feel a lot of emotional connection to. So I think it's a really fantastic book. It's beautifully written and I really appreciated it for that um, sense. And so I think for me, it would be like, I don't know, maybe a four and a half star. Um, but a lot of the characters are just so annoying, uh, often in funny ways. Um, but even the main heroines, um, I don't really... Uh, connect with a ton um, uh, and one of them Mary Ann who's one of the heroines I just feel like she's totally ridiculous um, in some ways um, so yeah okay getting into some of the uh, deeper analysis I guess so my kind of overwhelming experience reading this book is kind of just like these characters aren't compelling um, and one thing that has always put me off from this Jane Austen book in particular is that um, the love interests, uh, the male love interests, are all just sketchy. Um, like we don't really know anything about them um, and then we don't see any of the developing love between the female heroines and their male love interests um, like we do with Darcy and Elizabeth and Pride and Prejudice. You know, we actually are witness to their conversations with each other um, and we can see their feelings developing and um, in this book, uh, Jane Austen is so focused on kind of the, almost the setting, um, and the social setting that the characters are in that we actually just don't even see that, which I think is, um, after now that I've read this book, um, I think is a, is a deliberate choice on her part. Um, and especially not being convinced at all by the male love interests. Um, one of the arguments that Helena Kelly is, is making in this book is, um, is that the male love interests are kind of deliberately not heroes at all um, in sense and sensibility um, and in some very particular ways. So Edward Ferrars, for example, who our heroine Eleanor ends up marrying, um, even Eleanor herself doesn't describe him in glowing terms. Um, so Eleanor herself is kind of like wishy-washy about him. Um, so she says about him, of his sense and his goodness, no one can, I think, be in doubt who has seen him often enough to engage him in unreserved conversation. The excellence of his understanding and his principles can be concealed only by that shyness which too often keeps him silent. So she's saying some kind of good things about him, but, but she's conveying almost some doubt about it. 
um, some some kind of just lack of uh, lack of certainty about you know his really good qualities. Um, and then one of the other other interesting things about him is um, kind of throughout the book, Eleanor is um, convinced that he's a good person and that um, some of the weird decisions that he's made are um, as a result of things that are thrust upon him and she ends up blaming his mother for a lot of his weird decisions but like when it comes down to the fact like he courted her in like a very traditional way almost at the very beginning of the book and so for most of the book all of Eleanor's friends and relations are utterly convinced that Edward Ferrers is going to propose marriage to her um, but he's been engaged for years to another girl in a secret engagement. And so is he, like, he's not an honorable person because he led this woman on, um, continues to visit her and her family, um, without telling her that his affections are engaged elsewhere, that he's actually not single. Um, and would, you know, an honorable person wouldn't do that. You know, it's, it's really just as bad as Willoughby who is the, the primary love interest of the other heroine, Marianne, through much of the book. And he's a bit more straightforward because we're, you know, we're very aware from early, early on pretty much that we should be suspicious of him and that he's a scoundrel. But he treats Marianne in that exact same way. He really has no intention of um, marrying her, but is happy to make her think that he might and to behave in such a way that just like with Eleanor, all of her friends and relations are convinced that he's going to offer marriage any day when he never has any intention. So... Um, when it comes down to their treatment of women, Edward Ferrers is really no different from Willoughby um, when it comes to Eleanor. Um, now, of course, Willoughby has other stuff in his past. Um, but anyway, keeping with the love interests, um, so we never really know anything about Edward. Uh, Willoughby, we know from the beginning, is a sketchy scoundrel. Um, and then finally is Colonel Brandon, who is around throughout the book as a friend, and then at the very end of the book, Spoiler alert, so if you haven't read it and you're going to read it, read it, stop. <laughs> um, but again, assuming you read it, um, Marianne ends up marrying Colonel Brandon, who's twice her age and um, has been a good friend, but she doesn't feel kind of a passionate love for him like she did for Willoughby. And Brandon has a shady past, um, and it's alluded, uh, not, not even alluded, it's, it's brought out straight into the open throughout the book that many people think that he has an illegitimate daughter who is his ward. There's a sad story, um, and at one point in the book, he confesses that story to Eleanor. And Eleanor um, comes out of that conversation, you know, convinced that Colonel Brandon is a very upstanding, honorable person, um, and that uh, the, the ward is not his illegitimate daughter. Um, and, uh, and he'd alluded to the fact that, you know, he, knew, he knows that people think that. Um, and he claims that she's not. Um, so one of the things that, that Helena Kelly does is is actually lay out the timeline of Colonel Brandon's life, which is in Jane Austen's text. Um, and show, so, so in Colonel Brandon's confession, he actually um, states explicitly, basically, that he wasn't in England around the time when this girl would have been conceived. Um, and he had been in love with her mother and had actually gone, uh, gone to India um, as part of trying to, to leave and try to let this woman have her life in a marriage she was forced into, etc. Um, so he pitches it as trying to do the honorable thing and leaving. And the way that he frames the timeline is that um, he must have been in India when this child was conceived. But then um, it's actually inconsistent, the different reports that we get of this girl's age. Um, and if you believe the reports that aren't his, <laughs> Yeah, then he actually was in England uh, when she would have been um, conceived or could have been in England. Um, it was before he went to India. So there's a little bit there too. And Helena Kelly actually goes pretty deep into it in a way that I find a little bit less convincing. Um, but she is an academic. But uh, chasing, um, chasing through kind of uh, continuities in naming in the book and pairing them with naming conventions um, to, to claim that there, there might be some um, kind of like circumstantial evidence in the book other than that timing thing that also points to hints that um, she might be Brandon's illegitimate daughter. Um, so that's kind of interesting. And then another thing that I didn't know that I learned from Kelly's book is that at the time when Sense and Sensibility was written, um, so it was published in 1811 and 
Um, there's a lot of disagreement about when Austin actually sat down and wrote it. It could have been as early as like 1801, 1802, and then with likely revisions after 1805 as she got it ready for publication. Um, and at that time in England, um, going to India was actually very frowned upon. So it was, it was um, the British East India Company had kind of been exposed um, for its uh, gross abuses. Um, and that was not really a desirable connection. And the people who went to India and made their wealth and then came back were considered, you know, like crass and not true aristocracy or true, um, you know, kind of like new money. Um, and they were they were not respected. And even just being kind of a regular um, person, I forget if he was in the army or something. Yeah, Colonel Brandon was in the army. Um, that would have been frowned upon as well. And one argument Helena Kelly makes is that that was a deliberate decision that Austin made to have Brandon have been in India for like five years. You know, she could have given him any other thing. You know, he essentially could have even been the same character, but having gone to Canada as part of the army instead of India. And so the fact that she deliberately chose that with its negative connotation together with all of this discrepancy that we get around um, his ward, who could be an illegitimate daughter, um, suggests that maybe Austin, if we take this radical reading of, um, of her work, could have been kind of deliberately casting that doubt on Colonel Brandon's character. Um, and so altogether, we end up with three love interests who are all whack, you know, <laughs> like, I don't trust their motives, what? Um, and so that kind of brings me to uh, the main thing, um, which Kelly points out uh, through several lines of evidence that sense and sensibility of all of Jane Austen's works is the one that is most focused on kind of the economic underpinnings of British society of that time, and in particular, the ramifications of the importance that was placed on primogeniture and on the ownership of land. And so owning land was so important. That was how you were able to vote and have political representation and social clout. Um, it was so important that they had these really complex inheritance laws that essentially concentrated all of the land wealth in the oldest son in families. And that's also part of the um, original plot mechanic of Pride and Prejudice as well. In both these books, we, we end up with um, one of the main tensions driving things is the fact that all of the women um, are, are disinherited in Sense and Sensibility um, when our heroine's father dies and in Pride and Prejudice are facing the future of certain, um, you know, a certain reduction in their status um, because they will inherit essentially nothing when their father dies and it's because of these convoluted laws. Um, and so Kelly just really dives into all of the ramifications of that and it all just like results in such a complete devaluation of being a woman <laughs> that it's like, uh, you know, as much as we tend to romanticize in this day and age, you know, kind of this Regency period, um, these times in England of like being a lady and swanning around with Mr. Darcy, but it's just like the intense amount of financial insecurity and anxiety that all of these women have is like insane. <laughs> um, so that was very stressful to start reading about. In Sense and Sensibility, that's mostly played out um, partly in the beginning of the book when um, the heroines, Marianne's and Eleanor's, uh, their father dies and they are from a second marriage and their half-brother from the first marriage inherits absolutely everything um, and their, their father on his deathbed kind of makes some allusion to the fact that there's just no way to divide the estate. Um, legally and then so one interesting thing about this book in particular um, is the real parallels that it has with her life and the way that this issue of primogeniture really played out in her life. Um, so Jane Austen was one of eight children um, and her older brother James um, was set to inherit everything that her parents had and they were not particularly wealthy. Um, you know her father was a preacher. I don't know what the official terminology in Church of England is. Anyway, uh, he was a preacher, so he what he wouldn't be able to pass on um, like his, his house and things after he died because those would stay uh, to whoever would be the next preacher in that area. Um, but he, you know, he did have some money um, and he certainly had his name, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera, and so all of that is supposed to go down to his oldest son, James. Um, but then the interesting thing is that um, because he's not uh, because he was not in the wealthy, you know, aristocratic, aristocratic classes. So all of this pressure to put things on the first son would have just been cultural for Mr. Austin, um, since he didn't have property. And so he actually had 
technically a choice. You know, he didn't have to pass everything on to that oldest son. And it's particularly egregious in the case of the Austins because their oldest son, James, was set to inherit a very wealthy estate from a wealthy uncle. And with eight children, including two daughters, what Mr. Austin still decided to do was give James everything he had. And he did it while he was still living. So James actually took over the like preacher job um, and got his parents savings, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So it was just, just like a deliberate, even while he was alive, like rejection of, um, you know, his daughters, despite like a fairly happy childhood, you know, Jane has many letters where she talks about the positive impact that her father had um, on her life and even in encouraging her writing. Um, and so it, it's, yeah, it's this interesting thing where it's like if you were a landed family, um, you know, you were often constrained by law uh, to continue these primogeniture things, but then there was also just this weight of social, um, uh, social expectation that would still do that. And so Jane Austen was essentially penniless, she and her sister, and relying on their brothers for um, kind of charitable support. And then, of course, Jane Austen was able to be somewhat successful with her writing in her lifetime and get paid for that. Um, but so it's, uh, yeah, like that had real bearing on her own life. And so it's not surprising at all that that is um, part of the fundamental setting of some of her novels, and especially in Sense and Sensibility. Um, it's kind of an exact uh, parallel of her life and just really shedding light on kind of that complete rejection of, um, of women in society. Um, and another interesting aspect of that is that women, uh, you know, they kind of get the double shaft. So it's like while you're in a family, you know, when you're a wife, a mother or a sister, um, you're expected to provide all of the, you know, things that women culturally are expected to do. So all of the nurturing and homemaking and everything. Um, and, you know, it's reasonable to expect at a bare minimum that you would get to keep your home. But no, you have absolutely no power over that. And so when your spouse dies, you can just be cast out on the street and you're like, you're just totally reliant on uh, kind of the benevolent goodwill of um, the man who inherited the property. Um, and to some extent, you know, whatever women they would bring into the house who would then be the new mistresses, etc. And so it's just like you have no, um, no agency on that sort of setup over your life and your future. Um, so that was really upsetting to read about. Um, so that's basically kind of the, the main things that I got out of um, the chapter in this book on Sense and Sensibility. It was really a deep dive into that inherent in, inheritance and economic stuff. Um, there's a lot more details to it that I did not just try to recap because I barely understood it when I was reading the book. It's, English law was very convoluted. Um, so I do really recommend uh, checking out this book if you're interested in Jane Austen and wanting to know more about the cultural, social, political context. Um, I will say in this chapter, she went um, kind of a bit deeper into like supposition than, um, than I was really expecting in her Pride and Prejudice chapter. Kind of all the points that Kelly was trying to make seemed really grounded in the text to me. Um, and there's a bit more conjecture in this one. So one of the pieces of conjecture, just circling all the way back to what I was saying about Edward Ferrars being uh, kind of a sketchy character, is she starts to just kind of imagine okay, we know that his younger brother, Robert, went to a very prestigious um, school in London, and we know that Edward Ferrars went to a private tutor, essentially a private boarding house in Exeter. And that just seems a little bit weird, like Exeter was on the other side of the country from where Edward and his family were from, and he was the oldest son, and one of the main plot points in the story is how much pressure his family was putting on him to have kind of a prestigious career, and he just really wasn't interested interested in it. Um, and his family had no respect for his lack of interest. They were still kind of pushing him. And so in that context, it's a little bit weird that the younger son rather than the older son went to the prestigious school. And so one of the conjectures that, that Kelly puts forth is that there might have been something kind of wrong with Edward, <laughs> um, using that term broadly. Um, but uh, maybe awkwardness or, um, you know, or something. And so what she actually suggests is maybe some sort of sexual deviance um, that would have resulted in his parents maybe wanting to get him out of the house in somewhere private. Um, and so she kind of ties 
the a little bit of weirdness about his schooling to a scene towards the end of the novel when Edward is explaining in a very emotionally charged situation to Eleanor um, about why he couldn't break his engagement to um, the woman he'd been previously engaged to and his feelings about it and everything and he's absent-mindedly fiddling and he picks up scissors that had um, you know some sort of like cloth sheath um, and he just absent-mindedly cuts up the sheath and so Kelly goes into a Freudian thing about um, you know sheath comes from like it's related to the Latin word for vagina or something, which was um, becoming popularized as a medical term um, during Jane Austen's lifetime. And so she's like, this points to Edward Ferrars' sexual deviance. And then questions whether Eleanor could really be happy with him. And I'm like, that maybe seems like it's going a bit far out on a limb. So um, that would be my one comment on the Sense and Sensibility chapters. Um, that and uh, you know she towards the end she has some other things that she points to for maybe Eleanor not being happy with Edward after the book ends and similarly for Marianne maybe not being happy with Colonel Brandon after the book ends um, you know just total total conjecture that um, I found a little bit less compelling than um, I did the Pride and Prejudice chapter where like I said everything was seemed very firmly grounded in the text in comparison so I will just throw that out there. This I do think this book is excellent and well worth reading, but it went a little, um, little off the rails in the Sense and Sensibility chapter. So overall, great book. I think four and a half stars. It's a wonderful piece of fiction. Um, but uh, yeah, it is unsettling to read. And I was ex interested rereading it as an adult reader because in high school, I was just kind of like, oh yeah, the romance isn't as compelling as in Pride and Prejudice. So it's kind of a meh book. And rereading it before I read the chapter in here, I was like, this is kind of unsettling. Like, I just do not like what's going on here. Um, you know, all these interactions with the characters and all the social stuff and everything. I was like, that's just, like, I don't really get it. And it feels really unsettling. Um, and I think Shane Austin intended it to. Um, and so then reading this book and hearing a bit more detail about, um, you know, how firmly entrenched it was that women were property. It's like, oh, that's why I thought it was unsettling. So anyway... It's five o'clock in the state where I was born, so I decided I would spend a little bit of time doing this video and thinking about how awful 18th and 19th century England were for women, and then I'm gonna open my beer and <laughs> relax a little before I have to pick my kid up from daycare. So, hope you enjoyed this slightly rambling video. If you've read Sense and Sensibility, I would love to hear what you thought about it, what you liked about it, if any of this stuff you picked up on is kind of being unsettling in the text. Um, I'd be really curious uh, to hear your thoughts. So stick around. If you want to see more content from me, hit the subscribe button, and I hope to see you all in the next video. Thanks. Bye.